Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Well, our speaker this evening, <clears throat> Mr. Fred S. Dubin of New York City. And uh, uh, Fred is a president of Dubin Bloom Associates in New York City. Uh, he also has uh, an office uh, Fred S. Dumid Associates International in Rome, Italy, and also an office in uh, West Hartford, Connecticut. He's a consulting engineer and a planner, an energy management consultant, and is perhaps, uh, if not the, one of the very few uh, top consultants in energy management in the world. Uh, Fred graduated from uh, Carnegie Institute of Technology in 1935 uh, with a degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, he is the first uh, mechanical engineer that I have uh, run into who is also uh, receiving his Master of Architecture degree from Pratt Institute. Uh, he has the work completed and will be awarded that degree, which I think is quite unique. Uh, uh, Fred uh, has um, <clears throat> distinguished himself uh, in his uh, field of endeavor to a considerable extent. He has uh, been a visiting lecturer at many schools of architecture throughout the United States, Canada, and foreign countries. Uh, he was named by Engineering News Record uh, as the engineer who has made his mark in 1975 for his work in energy conservation. And in 1974, he was selected by our United States uh, uh, State Department, Department of State, as an American specialist and invited to lecture in Greece, France, Holland, uh, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden on energy conservation and on uh, solar energy. Uh, similarly, in 1975, uh, he was in Spain and Portugal, England, Iran, and Israel. Uh, he has served as a consultant to a number of federal and uh, state agencies, uh, including the U.S. General Services Administration, uh, the Federal Energy Administration, the National Bureau of Standards, the uh, Veterans Administration, uh, IRDA, Atomic Energy Commission, National Institute of Health, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he has also uh, provided the power system for such institutions as uh, the Berkeley Labs. Uh, he has worked with the American Institute of Architects uh, Energy Task Force and the AIA Research Corporation, and I could go on and on and on on this. Uh, he is li licensed as an engineer in many states, and uh, he is a fellow of the uh, American Society of uh, Heat, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning Engineers, as well as a fellow of the American Consulting Engineers Council. Uh, he, he has done uh, mechanical and electrical uh, work for major construction projects, uh, the Salk Institute, look at La Jolla, and uh, uh, the General Services Administration Energy Conservation uh, and demonstration building in Manchester, New Hampshire, which I know many of you are familiar with. And uh, as a result of his research, uh, uh, much of this has been published. It's in a very usable form for architects and engineers. And uh, uh, incidentally, he conceived the uh, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning uh, concept for our Stevens Auditorium and our Hilton Auditorium. Uh, when Ray Kreitz and uh, Dick McConnell and Brooks Borg were uh, uh, designing that uh, particular building. Well, uh, I better stop here, Fred, and uh, uh, 
just simply say that he will speak to us this evening on energy conservation and research in buildings. Uh, Mr. Fred Duman. Thanks, Don. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am particularly glad to be here tonight because I had a chance to visit my daughter, Libby, who's finishing her medical education in Des Moines and renew old acquaintances with uh, Don and uh, Kreitz, Ray Kreitz and um, Bill Borg and people that we had a great pleasure in working with here. Uh, it's nice to be the conceptual engineer because you don't have to worry about whether it really works or not. Somebody else did the final design. You don't have all the problems of the change orders and extras and that sort of thing. But I think uh, I, I like the building and the facility, and I hope you do too. Um, I was going to tell you a little bit about our firm's background just to give you an idea of, of, of uh, the perspective from which I'm talking, but I don't have to since Don overdid himself on that. <laughs> I think, however, uh, I, I do want to stress a couple of things before I get into the meat of some technical things that I'd like to share with you. And what I plan to do is uh, give us a little background of the energy situation and then go into some case histories of projects which we primarily have been associated with to demonstrate some of the principles which we'll discuss. And uh, if anything comes across, it's that every building and every project is unique and there is maybe a building type within that type there are individual characteristics which make it, a, make it very essential that we do a, a, a thorough audit and a thorough uh, analysis of the individual project. I think one of the problems we're using a lot of energy is we've taken a broad brush uh, approach to, to buildings and systems. And uh, we aren't, haven't been selective in design. We like the top of filing cabinets, have done in the past at least, the same uh, intensity and uh, the same uh, foot candles as a, as a more severe task. We ventilate spaces, whether anybody in them or not. And I guess now it's time that we um, are selective in our design, selective in analysis, and in our programming. Well, these, I think, are really important times because uh, without going through the energy crisis, and I really believe it's a crisis, and many people don't because uh, the gas lines are no longer exist and fuel is plentiful if you pay for it and it's not all that expensive even as compared to Europe, Greece where we're working, it's $2.70 a gallon for gasoline. But um, I think that uh, a crisis is when you're approaching a, a catastrophe and you don't do anything about it, that's a crisis. Once you uh, have the catastrophe, it's no longer a crisis and it's too late. So we do have a chance to do something, and I say we, I'm talking really about the design professions for a moment, but uh, the di design professions certainly are impotent alone. They're, it requires a very, very concerted effort by all segments of the economy, legislatures, of course, financial institutions, and people at large to uh, approach the problem that we are fast uh, is approaching us. Now, the, the supply and demand equation is out of balance. We are, don't have the domestic production of fossil fuels, which are the majority of our energy sources, uh, that keep up with our demand. And so our imports are increasing till almost 50% of all our oil is imported today. And so you say, so what? So what is that we're facing inflationary times more and more? Uh, it's affecting our whole social fabric and our economic system. And it can have and will have very, very serious implications of being able to operate uh, in any kind of a, a manner acceptable to most of us. So if for no other reason, there's a great need for a, an energy management program. And energy management it departs a little bit from the concept of energy conservation in that energy management embodies energy conservation. And conservation, we're talking now about uh, reducing energy demand and reducing the demand on non-renewable resources. But also energy management is using the most appropriate fuel at the most appropriate cost, which is the lowest cost, of course, of the individual consumer, and having the flexibility in our systems to be able to switch from one fuel to another as the situation changes. One thing is quite apparent, we have regional problems. New England has very little of any, hardly any, natural resources, energy resources. Uh, some areas have coal. You're blessed with uh, high sulfur coal here, but that can be handled and at a cost. 
uh, in fluidized bed boilers and coal gasification at the cost of water and other uh, dollar costs. Certain areas have uh, other kinds of coal, certain have oil. And as a matter of fact, these very uh, regional differences make it hard to come to a national energy policy because there are compelling reasons for each region to um, take care of its own immediate problem without realizing that it, it becomes all of our problems very, very quickly. Now, if we, and also, of course, the, the, the idea of pollution, and I think if we had all the cheap energy that we could use, it would probably be one of the worst things in the world for us. We'd build a lot more junk that would pollute the atmosphere. The thermal pollution is really serious, and uh, it's serious, but without knowing how it's serious, because some say thermal pollution will increase the heat uh, by the, on the earth and melt all the snow caps and flood us, and the others say we won't get any heat. Take your choice. We're in between, which says that on the average we're fine. If we stick our behinds in the refrigerator and heads in the oven, we're averagely comfortable. But uh, So averages, I think, uh, have got to be um, uh, dispensed with when we look at the energy situation and our design options for solving uh, some of the problems. Now, we are facing, of course, higher costs no matter what the supply is. Every gallon of oil, every cubic foot of gas, every ton of coal costs more than the last bit of energy to remove from the earth. Uh, so that regardless of availability, and uh, I'm not slopping it off because availability is becoming a real problem regionally and, and, and nationally and internationally, uh, we will be facing higher costs, which are draining off resources, draining off uh, money that we need for other social and uh, economic uh, improvements, and so that uh, we can't just say uh, we can handle higher costs. We're, we're, we're showing that we can't handle it. Pro programs have been cut back federally and state levels because a large part of our resources are going to energy, and a large part of the individual's resources, the, the homeowner, the small business owner, those who can't pass on energy costs to the next consumer, uh, are suffering uh, an economic hardship. Now, getting down to buildings, buildings use about 30 to 35 percent of all the energy used in the country today. That's existing buildings, which is very important because we talk very often and most often about new buildings and what we can do in design, when really the uh, culprit today is existing buildings. And if we add to that, let's say it averages 33 percent, that's energy for heating, lighting, air conditioning, uh, domestic hot water process within the building. If we add to that the cost of the sewage treatment, plants, the electrical generating plants, the water, potable water treatment plants to support buildings, we're adding another 5% roughly to the energy usage. And if we add another 3 to 5% of the energy to produce the materials and move them over land or overseas, we're, we're facing over 40% of the energy usage in buildings, which is uh, uh, probably a double-headed uh, blessing in, in disguise because while it, uh, it's a frightening amount, it also says that we have a very major part of the energy problem that we can address on a one-to-one -one basis. We are concerned with buildings. We have less to do with power plants except through public uh, proclamation and, and involvement, but our involvement is very direct with buildings as designers, as engineers, architects, and other associated disciplines, so that uh, really the, uh, the, the challenge now becomes an opportunity. And, uh, what I want to show is that we are able to do something positive about it. This is not going to be a gloomy speech. This is going to be a very optimistic one. Um, now, why should the architect engineer be particularly selected for this choice role of saving the world? Uh, first of all, his training and his experience are particular to him. They're peculiar to him. And uh, he is a major, they are the major disciplines in the society that by their training and their involvement are closest to the energy situation as, it regard to, as regards to buildings and the ones who have the power within their practices to do something about it. Uh, if he doesn't have the expertise, the architect engineer can acquire it, and that's why I guess we're here. And architecture is an art and a science, uh, and it expresses the needs of the time. And uh, in my studies of architecture, part of it, of course, has been Architectural History 103, a two credits, uh, and, and, and you know, begin to look at what architecture really is. And I think one of the things that's come home to me is architecture is an art and a science. I'm going to use the term architecture and engineering synonymous here. If I use one term, it means the other, because uh, 
you really cannot separate the two disciplines. And uh, if, uh, if the architecture is an art and a science that expresses the needs of the times, as you look back, we, we went through an industrial revolution. Our, our task then was to build industrial buildings and industrial process, increase the gross national product through, through industry and science. And architecture responded to that time. It responded to the times of material availability. We had the cast iron age of Louis Sullivan and others. And uh, back through history, we see that architecture always in response to a need of the times. Well, if there's a need of the times today, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a need for an energy and an energy policy, an energy conscious practice, because energy is probably the one underlying factor that can be identified that cuts across all segments of our society and our living. It all boils down to energy. Some of it's human energy, psychic energy, physical energy, but this becomes really the bottom line. And without energy, uh, we can't have any of the kinds of uh, things that we build a society on. So, but there are others who are needed in the team, and the owner is certainly part of the team, the financier, the legislators. I was hoping some would be here today because they're in session now and they're addressing energy matters, and we hope to see much more legislation passed of a particular nature that I think can be very beneficial even though many architects and, and many engineers and many rugged individualists, which I happen to class myself as, say that we don't need uh, legislation, we don't need government uh, involvement, it interferes with the creative process and all that bunk. It doesn't. It, there's absolutely a need for legislation to, um, to bring about some of the actions that we're going to talk about today. They will not happen voluntarily. Uh, I wish they would, but they won't. They haven't. And as soon as the gas line shortened and uh, as soon as people got used to the higher prices, which after the embargo, the consumption curve took off in the same direction it, it, it was following before the, these crises. So we're going to need some, uh, hopefully, incentives, disincentives, maybe a big stick, maybe a soft stick, but we're going to need these kinds of institutional measures to accomplish what we're going to talk about tonight. I can hear you say, well, why don't you get on with what we're going to talk about? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'll skip some so I can get on with it. Anyway, architecture, John Eberhardt, AIA Research Corporation, says architect is a design of buildings to provide shelter for human activities that mediate against the climatic factors. It's true, but I also feel architect is an art and science that can alleviate or exacerbate, well, that's a word, the needs of the time with the methods and the materials and the production methods are available and can be innovatively integrated into the whole design process. So what we, do, what we do need is energy conscious design. And I've got a little definition of energy conscious design or, or a list of items that that includes. And this, this is important. First of all, buildings don't use energy at all. The windows don't use energy. The walls don't use energy. People use energy. And the best way to save energy for buildings is not to build the buildings. Well, uh, we need some buildings. So the next step is how do we utilize the buildings? How much space do we really need? We did the GSA building, which I'll talk about in Manchester, New Hampshire, and the, the legislators uh, and federal legislators from New Hampshire had put down their requirements for offices that were 18 by 30. We uh, said the first way to save energy is to cut those offices to 10 by 12. Because once we have space, we have to heat it and we have to cool it and humidify it and dehumidify it and light it. And uh, so when we look at a building energy program, the first thing is to look at is how much space is needed in order to determine how much space is needed, we must then carefully analyze the program of what's going to happen in that building now and anticipate it in the future. Well, for the present, it's fairly easy to write a program uh, of what will happen in the building. The program is mostly handed down or given, but I think we have to challenge many assumptions. But for the future, what's happened in the past when people said, let's take care of the future in our buildings, they made them flexible. Now, two things that really bugged me. One is flexibility in buildings. And the other is a module, because once you have a module, whether it's based on a window, a structural system, a ceiling grid, something goes in the module. Nature abhors a vacuum in a module. And once you have a module, you have a lighting fixture in it. I guess they call them luminaires today. Not when I went to college, they were fixtures. And you have an air diffuser, which we used to call a register. And once those are in there, they're used. And you can see that, uh, you can see it right here. Every light's lighted here back here. Um, and we don't need it all. So that the module be, begins to be an energy waster. And uh, we would like to see more non-modular design, but providing mechanical and electrical services and other needed amenities where people need them for the purpose they need them, when they need them, and then do away with them when they aren't needed 
when the building is closed or act occupancy changes. Now again, um, I used to shock my architect friends by saying the windows don't, need en don't use energy and the walls don't use energy. They cause energy to be used, and a single pane of glass in the north in Iowa causes a lot of energy to be used in the boiler plant. And I think it's important to keep this concept in mind because we've got to separate the really three major, four major factors in energy uh, use. One is, is certainly the, the, the user of the building, how hot or how cool he wants it, how much ventilation he needs and requires, uh, how much humidity and humidification, because this determines the building load. And that building load is also responsive to the envelope and the environment that en that envelope sees. The building envelope, of course, being the walls, the uh, windows, doors, roof, ceiling, and, and basement floor slab or floor slab. So that uh, those are the kinds of things we've got to look at first is to reduce the building load, reduce the amount of heating required, reduce the amount of cooling required, uh, reduce the amount of lighting required by doing away with uh, uh, overlighted places that are not being occupied by reducing building loads by insulation and all the common things that everybody knows about today. But after the building load is, is, is reduced, the distribution system that carries energy, moves energy from the energy conversion equipment, the boiler, the furnace, the um, air conditioning compressor, the chiller, the cooling tower, it moves the energy from one area where it has taken in fuel and converted it to heat or cooling and moves it to the building, to the space. And that distribution system, we call those loads parasitic loads because they don't really do anything except move energy from one place to another. And they require additional energy to be used in the process because they have thermal loads from the envelope, from the, from the duct system, from the piping system. And they also use a lot of energy to drive air or pump water through pipes or conduits. And so if the building load is less, the load of the distribution system is already less, it can be reduced and then it can be improved for its own sake even after the loads are, are reduced because by better insulation, better uh, uh, configuration of piping, we reduce the amount of energy to drive the fans and the pumps. And then we finally get back to the major pieces of equipment that do take in uh, fuel, oil, gas, coal, um, and convert it to heat or to chill water or take in electricity and distribute the electricity. And I think that that's a basic principle, is to look at these three factors as we address buildings. Now, if we're going to take this approach, we have a tremendous opportunity to go into what we call, and what's called commonly today, passive design. And for an active engineer, I'm very active in passive systems. And I believe that passive systems, which is really the handmaiden of conservation, are absolutely essential and cost-effective to do before we do all these fancy mechanical and electrical systems. And they got fancy because in the old days, the architects wanted a lot of glass and uh, many other factors that demanded a brut brutal approach of putting enough cool air, enough hot air into a building to overcome these building loads. Today, the more enlightened architects and engineers are not approaching building design that way. However, they're very, very slow to adopt the principles of passive energy design, passive building design. Passive design really means using natural energy sources. There's, there's a lot of free energy out there. Not free to move it often, but it's free. It's there. It is an energy source. What are they? The sun, of course. And in the wintertime, the low rays of the sun permitted to come into a building can provide uh, often enough heat for that building all day long without any additional fossil fuel being burned. And at nighttime, that same window, which let the sun in the daytime, uh, lets the heat go out. So therefore, we've got to then block the heat from escaping at nighttime by thermal barriers, thermal shutters, which my grandfather used to call shutters, now we call them thermal barriers. And this is one way to trap the heat and not let the heated air or the heated space dissipate to the outdoors at nighttime. Now, there's some problems with that because if we have a wall, and we went to a building today, Don and I, to look at it, uh, there's a lot of solar southeast sunshine today, and the room was overheated. And if we were working in that room, it would be very uncomfortable. And if there had been drapes on there, we'd have had to pull them and keep the sun out. Rather than designing that, that room without a wall-to-wall -wall glass, but perhaps 50% glass, 50% of the linear distance glass, so that we could get in behind the wall, a solid wall, not be overheated personally, let the sun come in, then with sufficient mass in the building, concrete, tile, brick, that can absorb that excess heat, uh, we could 
take full advantage of the sun when it shines, heat, the, heat the, the contents of the building, the floors, the mass, and then let that give up its heat later in the day when the sun has disappeared. That's passive design. Passive design is using the wind in the proper manner. In the wintertime, walking the wind from wiping the glass, wiping the walls, because the wind on those surfaces increase heat loss. In the summertime, we want to take advantage of the natural breezes. This becomes a, fact, a function of how the building is sited. First of all, understanding there are winds, where the winds come from, what their intensity is. It's also true, of course, of the sun. We've got to really begin to look at the basic uh, climatic conditions that exist so that we can use them when they're, when they're be benevolent. When they aren't, we want to do something to act, put a barrier between the environment and ourselves inside. Another really effective uh, passive measure is to do passive cooling of a building. We're doing a building for the Justice Department in California. It's a big building. It's 320,000 square feet. And studying the climate in Sacramento, we note that it gets to be 110 degrees in the daytime in the summer and down to 60 at night. That diurnal swing is a tremendous source of energy. And by bringing that cold air at nighttime into the building, we can cool the building structure so that the next day there's a cooling capacity on reserve that permits us not to run the air conditioning the next day for many hours, depending upon how much mass is in the building and how we brought that outdoor air in at night in, at nighttime. That's passive design. And uh, there are other factors, of course. The, uh, the entire problem of shading, the entire prob prob problem of, and, and I don't call it a problem, an opportunity of using thermal mass the way uh, the Indians that didn't have architects did. And the way uh, we go back into history, we see the, the use of uh, heavy adobe construction, heavy mass walls, the old churches and all throughout the world. And, and here, of course, are cool in the summertime without any air conditioning. And thermal mass is a very, very usable concept if it's done properly. But thermal mass requires that the insulation be on the exterior of the wall and not on the interior, as we do today in common practice. So the mass is within the building and not outside the, the uh, insulated envelope. Um, but there, there's, a, there's a little joker in this. And uh, we worked on the Salk Institute with Louis Kahn, a great architect, and a great individual, a great human person, humanist. Um, he used to say that uh, architectural design, true design, is starting with an immeasurable thought, concept, feeling. And then you reduce this to measurable, feet and inches, yards, well, centimeters and meters today, I guess that should be, measurable, in the room dimensions and spaces. And then you end up with an immeasurable. You end up with a feeling that the building evokes. And uh, so that process, immeasurable, measurable, immeasurable, I think we can also use that in our concept of passive design. Passive design is a deceptively simple concept. We're going to use natural energies. We're going to move energy from one place to another. We're going to move it from the sunny side of the building to the shady side, from day to night. And uh, it's a very beautiful concept. It's, it's lovely. And you can't measure that at the moment. Now, in order to design a building to be able to do that, that building has to become a heat exchanger. That's why I say architecture and engineering, there are no difference. Uh, engineer, heat exchanging is an engineering term commonly, but it's an architectural uh, problem. The building must become a heat exchanger. It doesn't do any good to bring the cold air in at night through some openings and let it go out the other side without ever wiping the mass in the building. We have a hung ceiling above this concrete mass. That cold air never sees that concrete mass and can't cool it. However, by making the building a heat exchanger, making the air, forcing that air to come up maybe above a hung ceiling in contact with the mass, now we can cool the mass 6, 8 degrees at nighttime which provides uh, more than 50% in California for this particular building of all the cooling energy that will be required for this building. So the building becomes a heat exchanger, and that takes a very sophisticated design. Now, after we've done all that, we end up with a very beautifully, simply operated system. So we've gone from the immeasurable to the measurable to the intensive design process, and back we end up with a simple system. And I think this becomes quite basic in architecture and engineering. Well, I talked a little bit about flexibility, and I'm not going to go into that. I've got some notes on it. We, as I say again, it isn't flexibility we're looking for. We're looking for adaptability. The Salk Institute is a very good example of an adaptable building. The building has interstitial space. That means space above the usable or the laboratory floor level. Within the interstitial space, there's distribution for heating and piping and air conditioning. 
for equipment, and the interstitial space can accommodate equipment or systems to, uh, to, to serve changing needs within the laboratory space, and that's what a laboratory is. We, uh, we talk about program, and let me divert, uh, digress for a moment, and program is extremely important. And when we started the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, we asked Jonas Salk, what's the program for this building? What are we designing for it? He said, if I knew that way, I wouldn't need a building. So what was he saying? He said, we've got to have a building that can accommodate any kind of a program we want to do here, but don't spend any money to do it. Uh, make the building adaptable. And adaptability is far different from flexibility. Flexibility is redundancy. If you put enough things on a grid, lights and ducts and pipes, and uh, you'll have uh, facilities that serve any need whenever you need them, but you've paid a lot of money for systems that you may never need. 80% you'll never need. However, a building that's adaptable permits you to make changes within the building to add to the major distribution runways to feed systems as they come on the line. As the building program changes, the scientific program changes, and this is what Jonas Salk was saying, uh, by the very nature of the institution, it's a research institution, we don't know what we'll do here next week or next year, therefore make this building accommodate what we have to do in the future. And it boiled down to an interstitial space with simple runways on centers that we could then extend ducts, extend pipe, oxygen, nitrogen, any 300 square foot area within the building without disturbing anybody around. And that's an adaptable building. And that becomes a pretty good principle because I think, I really think flexibility has caused us to use one of the major causes of energy waste in a building. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit before we're through about some solar energy, but I want to uh, uh, emphasize that John Hill, who has been an old pioneer in solar energy and a marvelous gentleman, uh, says that first you insulate and then you insulate, insulate the building. by active solar systems. So the first dollar you spend, the second dollar you spend, the third dollar you spend should be for passive and conservation systems. Fourth dollar can be for solar, active solar systems. But there's a, another reason for it. A solar energy system it has a particular phenomena of being able to produce more work if the fluid, the air or water that's heated from the collector can be at low temperature. Because if we take a solar collector and face the sun with it, and just let it be stagnate with no fluid flowing through it. It gets very hot. It gets to be 300, 400, 500, 600 degrees. So it's very hot, but it's not doing any work. We're not removing any heat from it. As soon as you start to circulate water or air through the collector, the temperature drops and you begin to do some work. Now, if the building is designed to reduce the thermal loads, it then is able to be heated with low temperature fluid. In other words, instead of requiring 180 degree water, it can be perhaps heated with 100 degree water. Now, if we can heat the building with 100 degree water, it means we can have a solar collector that can be cheaper to build, that will produce more BTUs for the same dollar invested than if we had to have 180 degree water. So there is that, again, cause and effect of an efficient building and a solar system. Furthermore, we won't be able to afford the, the really wonderful alternatives that are appearing in the market unless we do have conservation first and reduce the load. So it becomes a very, very basic concept is to reduce the load. I am going to show some slides here before I continue with some of this discussion. Uh, but uh, before I do, just a couple of things. For each building project, I think it's very important to establish a functional and a space utilization program and an energy uh, and environmental program for the building. The schools of architecture, if, as long as I've been associated with schools, we've been given or have given programs that say exactly what's going to happen, classrooms, uh, offices, uh, hospital beds, even down to the janitor's closet, 120 square feet for the janitor's closet. But there's never been really a, in any program we've seen, a very complete description of what the environmental systems must be and what the tasks that are going to occur in that building are so that we can decide how much light we need and where should it be and when should it be on and when should it be off, how much ventilation, how much energy is needed. And I believe if we take a building and look at it from a passive standpoint first and then a very, very complete environmental program, that building shape will evolve from the program. The building will already say uh, certain kinds of space wants to see the sun. A greenhouse, a, a day room in a hospital, a hospital nursing wings want to see the sun. Those rooms ought to be in the east and west. Other rooms don't want to see the sun. In fact, it's uh, inimical to the to the, uh, to the use of the space, uh, dark rooms, uh, 
auditoriums, they don't want the sun. It's, it's harmful, you've got to block it out. So if you begin to look at what kinds of spaces require sunshine, require natural illumination, require darkness, uh, what sorts of spaces don't require a very even temperature, let it float. Uh, storage rooms, equipment rooms, uh, spaces that are not uh, occupied, or spaces that are occupied with people doing fairly active work. These can be in the northern climates on the northern wall within the building. And again, the, 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 the program begins to dictate the shape of the building. That plus the external environment, which is acting on each of the walls. So I think the first step is to write a, a functional program as well as a space utilization program. Uh, then I think we should ha write a, an energy budget for the building. And uh, we're beginning to see energy budgets emerge. The General Services Administration Building in Manchester, New Hampshire, a, an energy demonstration building that we worked on, uh, developed an energy budget of 55,000 BTUs per square foot per year for all energy use for the building. Now, we know pretty much what office buildings' budget should be. We don't know that much about what the budgets ought to be for hospitals, uh, for hotels, and other kinds of buildings in different climates. And I think we, we've got to have a budget and a goal so that we can have some sites to set our design upon. And uh, we have a dollar budget and we have a land use budget. Why not an energy budget? I think we also have to know what can be done. What are the possibilities? What is really the potential? What can we accomplish if we do this sort of thing? The consumer has to know it in order to hire to ask you to do something. We have to know it. We've got to know the climate. We've got to know a lot more about the climate. Not only how, what the percentage of sunshine is in an area, we have that fairly well, but how many cloudy days are followed by clear days, how many clear days in a row, because this becomes, this cyclic nature of sunshine and clouds become an important design factor. Uh, we've got to know what the trade-offs are and what the cost benefits, and we've got to challenge the assumptions that we've been given. In the old days, they required 30 CFM of air, of fresh air, Massachusetts, uh, Sandy, they're up in Massachusetts, uh, for each pupil in a school. Where'd that come from? You couldn't find the historical precedent for it. Well, it came from the, from the kids who used to tiptoe through the cow pastures on the way to school, and every once in a while they'd miss, and you needed 30 CFM in the, in the classroom. You didn't need 30 CFM for the teacher. I guess they stayed in the high part. But, some of these codes came down to us that way. And you really, the, the largest single energy user in the country is outdoor air that leaks or is brought into the building intentionally. This is a major single cause for energy usage in buildings. And so therefore the buildings have to be tightened up, uh, ventilation codes have to be re-examined, the assumptions that we've so glibly accepted have to be changed. Even the tasks have to be changed. If I have, a, if I have a 40 foot candles of lighting and I have this glossy clay paper and glossy magazines, like Playboy, I don't read that, of course, but, um, you know, and you get valley reflectance in your eyes, uh, by changing the type of paper and get a dull matte finish, I could do it with less energy, less glare, and a more comfortable lighting. So the government could save millions of dollars in lighting by changing the, the way the pencils that they hand out. Well, what I'm saying is really we've got to challenge the tasks that are given, because the task often can be changed to suit the condition. If we have an office layout made by conventional methods, We'll find desks in one part of the room and filing cabinets in another. And very often the filing cabinets are near the outdoor, outside walls where there's natural illumination. By changing these desk locations in the task, we can then take advantage of a lot of natural light that the people need and the files don't need. And so the process is to change the tasks and change the, the, the design to suit the tasks. And together, we'll find energy consumption will drop tremendously. 40, 50, 60, and 70 percent in new buildings, and half of that easily in existing buildings, and often without any increase in first cost. Now let me let me go to some slides just to demonstrate some of the principles. Before I do that, I'm going to no, I'll hold that for a minute. Then I'm going to put some of these slides on and talk about each of these projects a little bit to demonstrate something uh, that's um, uh, perhaps special about the project or unique from an energy uh, standpoint. And I think another thing, we've got to be very, very biased when we approach energy conservation. I think each member of the team, and it is an interdisciplinary team, that's what we found out from conservation and solar, if nothing else, that it is a joint effort. But at the beginning, I believe that every one of the individual disciplines must be very, very biased for what he wants to do. If I'm an energy consultant, I want to save energy. I don't care about your program. I don't care about your costs. I don't care about your room layouts. I don't care about anything but saving energy. 
Someone else has another uh, viewpoint. I've got to have good circulation. Another one has another viewpoint. You eventually come together with these viewpoints, each with your own strong bias, and then you see where they mesh, where they gel, where, they, where the compromises made, have to be made, and then you look at what we call a cost-benefits analysis of the trade-offs, and you eventually come to a meeting in the minds. But you can't go in wishy-washy to start with. I think we've got to have our own very, very strong biases for what we want to do, and I have. Now, let me, let me put this slide, these slides out. Can I operate this from here in the house lights? Wow. I don't want those. Okay. Okay, this is an interesting diagram, the PIP diagram. It shows the age of fossil fuel from uh, 3,000, uh, minus 3,000 years to plus 3,000, and the amount of fossil fuel production and usage in a very, very small period of time. It'll, it'll peak at about 1970, uh, about 1985, world production, then it'll drop off again, and, and we've used it up. We've used up what took millions of years to produce, which can't be re, uh, reinvented. So this, uh, this chart, I think, is uh, quite uh, interesting to, uh, to look at the time frame of the, of the age of the fossil fuels. And we think that uh, nothing goes beyond our own lifetime. Uh, this, this, is, this causes us to take a hard look at what we're doing. Okay, this is a building in California. They had a very nice, heavy brick building on Wilshire Boulevard that stood there for about 40 years, built with a uh, thermal mass, uh, reasonable sized windows, and uh, the real estate board said, I can't rent that building. You've got to modernize it, modernize it. We've got to put insulated panels on the wall, strip it down to steel. They did, and they made a steel panel building, no solar control, no thermal mass, uh, and this replaced what was a perfectly good energy building. It could have been retrofitted in a manner which would have made it efficient, and it also had some character to it. I think uh, this kind of a building has very little uh, saving grace. Now, the General Service Administration was going to building like this in Manchester, New Hampshire. Look very much like that California building. As a matter of fact, as you travel around the world, if you get off an airplane, you can't tell what country you're in by looking at the buildings because they look the same. I was in Fairbanks, Alaska a month and a half ago, and I'm going to Iran. I've been there before, and the buildings look alike. And if you want to know where north, east, west, and south of the sun is in China, you can't tell by looking at the building facade because they look alike. Now, this is not selective design, and buildings have different influences. There's sunshine on one side of the building. There's uh, more... Uh, there's actually a difference of temperature from side to side. So the building should be designed to reflect uh, the environment that they see. Uh, then we were hired after this preliminary plan was made to do an energy conservation study uh, and come up with an energy conservation program. And it was the first time really that there had been such an intensive effort to examine the building envelope. That means the walls and the, the, the skin, was, as we said before. Its orientation, uh, the length-width ratio, the height, for a given program of 175,000 square feet, that was given. We challenged that. However, we said you don't need 175,000 because Senator McIntyre doesn't need it. He still got that office. It turned out to be the same size. But anyway, uh, we challenged the assumptions that were given us, and we were charged with saving 20% of the energy that this building would normally use. We said we don't want the contract. He said, why not? It's because 20% is too timid. You don't need to hire a consulting engineer to save 20%. Just open your eyes. So what do you want to save? We said a minimum of 35% and as much more as we can. So we studied the materials. We studied the, the, the insulated panel wall versus the thermal mass. We studied the color. We studied the insulation location. And we were able by making suggestions, and we used computer programs, and I'll have something to say about that later, to analyze what the energy reduction could be if we changed the building envelope, its configuration and materials, and it came to about 35% alone without touching the mechanical and electrical systems. When the course of doing this work, we solicited comments from uh, students and practicing architects and engineers and uh, others uh, throughout the country. We had over five to 800 in, uh, re responses. We took a vote on, in our office on each of the measures that were proposed. I'll just mention two of them. One was to make the building edible so when you finish it, you get rid of it. <laughs> well, well, that building didn't get any votes, strangely enough, even for my fat partner. But the other suggestion, and another suggestion, was make the building screw itself down the ground at nighttime, come back out in the daytime. That received 100% vote, 100%. And not because we're going to make the building do that, but because that 
student, it was a student, said something very, very important. He said, make the building adaptable to the environment that it sees. And that meant that you don't turn the building down on the ground at night, but you make each facade different to recognize the influences upon it. And uh, it's different for daytime, it's different from nighttime, it's different for the summer and the winter, and it becomes an organic, and probably is, and not, probably a is not a good word to use, it's overused organic architecture, but to me it was organic because it was living and it was changing. And then after, then after uh, uh, writing an energy program, program including, including an analysis of the kinds of mechanical and electrical systems that might be employed, uh, we, found uh, we found some interesting phenomena. One is that uh, we could reduce the size of the windows by, um, that if we reduce the size of the windows by 50%, we didn't cut the natural illumination by 50%, but we did cut the heat loss by 50%. And it began to see a relationship between window size Savings in energy because you could use more natural illumination and increased energy usage because of more heat loss and heat gain. So we said, how do we approach this? Well, when does the heat loss and heat gain occur? It occurs at nighttime, morning pickup for heat loss. And so we then said if we had thermal barriers on these windows, we could have our windows in the daytime, enjoy them, enjoy the view of the parking garage across the street uh, and the Merrimack River on another exposure and uh, take advantage of natural illumination, save power for lighting, and then at nighttime, close those windows off so we don't have heat loss. Because 15% of all the heat loss in this climate is due to windows at nighttime when no one's using them. Um, if you want to look at the stars, you can open one, one pane and look at it. So we studied all these systems and the mechanical electrical systems using the emergency generator, which is required for the handicap. We use that to drive air conditioning systems. We uh, didn't have any solar in its original concept because when we started this building four years ago, solar was supposed to not be an off-the-shelf item. We were told only to use readily available hardware and materials and equipment. So solar was not included at the, at the time. Well, this is a uh, picture of the model of the building as it now stands. And you can see the north has no windows because the north turned out to be mo the most energy-consuming facade in, in the cold climates. But on the north, instead of putting occupied spaces, we had corridors and storage areas and mechanical equipment rooms and areas that didn't really need any windows and therefore we could use more glass in other areas of the building and still reduce the loads. Now this is a, a picture of the building and there you'll see some solar collectors on top. Incidentally, this building turned out by the computer and by manual calculation to say it would use 40% of the energy that the building would normally use. This is without the solar collectors for the moment. And uh, a very, very important and surprising fact was that the building budget for the construction, the initial cost, was not increased one dollar. How can that be? Uh, it's quite easy to, to explain. Insul extra insulation costs more money. Extra mass costs more money. However, by doing those things, we were able to reduce the heat loss from four million BTUs per hour to two million BTUs per hour, which meant the heating equipment could be smaller and less costly. We were able to reduce the cooling load from 450 tons of refrigeration, the peak load, to 157 tons. That directly affected the initial costs. We were able to buy heat exchangers, which cost money initially, but the heat exchangers then further reduced the size of the equipment. And I'm not talking about savings and operating costs yet. I'm talking about initial cost trade-offs. And again, the whole building and its systems must be looked at as a system, a total system. So that it did end up costing no more money, about the same as, though, as the conventional building that I showed two slides back. Uh, I think this is a better looking building. Some people don't care for it. Nobody liked the other one. <laughs> so at least we got some that like the looks of this one. Uh, the solar collectors on the roof were a, an afterthought. We decided in, in this day and age, we cannot consider an energy conscious building without looking at some solar. So we made some analyses of the solar collector system. And uh, we felt that New Hampshire, uh, it would be cost effective. And by cost effective, I'm saying a 20 year payback for the government not cost effective to industry, they got to get their money back in three years. But for the government, 20 years was a cost effective measure to do solar uh, to a limited extent. So we have collectors, four rows of collectors, solar collectors, and they are arranged with a variable tilt so that we have them steeper in the wintertime and shallower in the summer. They're used for heating and cooling and hot water. And the solar collectors uh, uh, look like this because it really was a retrofit. The building was not designed for solar and therefore it's not a particularly handsome solar installation. It isn't. It looks like a billboard, which it is. 
however, if the solar had been the original program, that entire shape of that roof would have changed, as I'll show you in some other buildings. But what this building did do is to uh, make us very much aware of what could be done, of the analytical methods necessary to analyze energy conservation, and uh, really in the final analysis, what the paybacks can be. Now the building is instrumented by National Bureau of Standards, and we're beginning now to get some data back on the en actual energy use. And we're finding that we were right in some places and wrong in some. We have task lighting on one floor. Incidentally, an efficient lighting system costs less initially than an inefficient system. You have fewer fixtures. You have uh, lower intensity lamps. Uh, you do have more switches, but switches are not a very costly item as building construction costs go. So that actually you end up with a system that in this building has one and a quarter watts per square foot. The average office building has three to six watts per square foot. It's a better lighting system except for one floor, which I don't like one bit. It's got sodium lighting in it and uh, people don't like it. They all look like they have yellow jaundice. Uh, however, that's very valuable to find you don't like it. We don't want to do it again. <laughs> and the building was to be a demonstration and not to be the most efficient building that ever could be built. So we have seven kinds of heating systems in here, four different kinds of heat pump systems. We have seven kinds of lighting systems. We have one floor with 30% glass and other floors with 75 to 10% glass so that we can actually measure, and we do monitor, each individual system on each floor, so we'll have comparative performance for not only for good systems against a bad system, but comparative between all good systems. All systems were selected were energy efficient systems. Now here's the, uh, the pie, and I'm not gonna go through these numbers except to just keep in mind this diagram with 100% energy use, and this is what it looks like afterwards that's the wrong slide, but anyway, those pieces of pies come out due to improvement in lighting, improvement in the hot water system. Just by reducing the temperature of the domestic hot water in the flow, by putting flow restrictors on, we can save about 60% of the domestic hot water load. This you can do very, very cheaply in any building. Now, hot water countrywide uses about 4% of the energy. 4% is nothing to snicker at. So that each of these small percentages add up. Now this is a building that evolved from the GSA building. The, the uh, Argonne National Laboratories in Chicago came to us and said, we'd like a building just like the GSA building. Uh, they said, you don't want one just like it. Chicago's not in Manchester, New Hampshire. You've got different influences. It's two years later, we've got new materials, we've got new methods. We think you want a solar building. We think you do. And we said, what's the building for? It's to replace about, uh, well, I don't know how many square feet, but buildings that were using $320,000 a year for energy housed 1,000 people, uh, office workers. This building houses the same functions. It's considerably smaller because of better space utilization. But this building, by according to the computer, I don't care if it's 100% wrong, says it will use $27,000 a year for all utilities. How? Partly the whole facade, the whole south facade is a solar collector. The solar collector is integrated with the building skin. Same insulation that serves the collectors serves the building. And uh, there are also collectors on the roof. The collectors do a very small part, however, of the total savings in conservation again. Heat pumps, uh, the envelope, each facade is different. Different kinds of solar control in the south is against the east and west. Thermal barriers again. Heat recovery equipment, we take heat from the exhaust air and put it in the supply air. All of those measures add up. And then after we did this plan, we took a look at an atrium scheme with an open atrium, not an open, an atrium in the middle covered with, uh, with glass. The atrium turned out to be another energy saver because it brought in light to the interior areas. We were able to close up the exterior. It brought in heat when we wanted it. The lighting was controlled, the heat was controlled. The atrium provided circulation space as well, so it had multi-use and the circulation space in the atrium cut down the amount of circulation needed in the building, so the building became more efficient utilization, higher percentage of usable space, occupied space. And these are the sorts of things I think we've got to continually study as we look at each individual building design. And strangely enough, a lot of our buildings today have atriums we find have wide, wide application. Hospitals are great, and an energy building we've designed, which I'll show you if we have time, we've used an atrium. In every case, we found an atrium as an energy saver, and also creates delightful space. One hospital project we're doing, it's a, it's a student project, but it's a concept for a, for a children's hospital. We have an atrium which has uh, campgrounds in it, it has hiking trails on the first floor of the hospital. They don't think they're in the hospital. We hope they'll get out sooner with a better environment. Uh, this is a, uh, a group of, uh, of houses that was entered in a student competition. Uh, this was a group of uh, three women students from the University of Colorado entered this in the AIA Research Corporation. 
competition. I show you this because it's a contrast of the larger buildings. Here we've got buildings that are clustered, they're low cost housing, they're greenhouses on the south facade. The greenhouses only need about 50% of the light energy and the heat energy that strikes a greenhouse. The rest is either dispelled normally or overheats the greenhouse. By having thermal mass in the greenhouse, we can capture that heat when it's excessive and use it at nighttime or for the rest of the building. Also, the greenhouse that was, in, uh, was uh, integrated with collectors in the greenhouse and above the greenhouse. Do I have that electric pointer here? Did I ever get it? No. Oh, here it is. Uh, there were the, uh, the uh, greenhouses and then solar collector, air collectors here, built into as part of the roof. Clear story here, which housed storage tanks and natural ventilation. The cluster walls provide uh, more efficient, uh, uh, less heat loss. And uh, this entire concept was figured could be built for about a $27,000 house. It'd probably go to 37000 But it was one of the 10 winning entries out of 1,800 that was entered. The, the, the really thrilling part was there were 1,800 entries by students in this competition. And three years ago, you'd have had uh, probably a dozen entries. As a matter of fact, there was a competition. And uh, they had about a dozen entries a number of years back. So this is, uh, I think, the direction that uh, particularly students are going. They're far ahead of practitioners out there. Another building at the Argonne Labs, again, this building has solar collectors built in the fascia, and it also has a large uh, number of hot water tanks for process, and that hot water for the process can be all heated with solar. So again, the same kind of economic uh, benefits appeared with this building. Now this is Grassy Brook Village in Vermont. That is an energy conserving, energy conscious design. There, there are 10 condominium units clustered for common walls, uh, two by six studs, 24 inches on center instead of two by four, 16 inches on center, thicker, more insulation, less cost for the construction, thermal barriers again, sod covered roofs. The heat loss was cut by 50%. The energy savings due to the building treatment was 50%. The solar collectors here on the site, serve, it's, it's the first project with a group of collectors serving a multiple number of housing units. And uh, the collectors again will reduce the load by another 50%. So when we get all through this building, we'll use 25% of it, what it would have used if it had not been built in this manner. Uh, the solar collectors are mounted on really handsome wood trusses, and uh, it's in the woods, and the wood is very appropriate here, I think, with creosote. It'll last as long as the houses. And the collectors are in three arrays. Uh, these happen to be, I think, uh, Sunworks collectors. They're a collector with internal headers. No, they're not internal headers, I'm sorry. They're external headers. But since that time, we've learned that by buying collectors with internal headers, we can cut down the amount of field labor and field installation and save dollars. Um, so we learn from each job as we go along. Uh, these were the uh, water storage tanks, which were part of the basement. This was a sloping site. We had to have a lot of basement and foundation walls. And by making the foundations, uh, the water storage tanks, we saved money there, roughly about 40 cents a gallon. And we've got uh, three very large storage Containers. We have a heat pump in here which takes low temperature heat from the collectors at 60 and 70 degrees at some times and boosts it to 110. Means we have to design the heating system in the buildings to get, use 110 degree water. It's again, it's an integrated project. Uh, I won't go through the flow diagram, especially since it's upside down, but you can recognize the sun. No, it isn't upside down. The sun's where it belongs, backwards, isn't it? Uh, anyway, we don't have time. If we do, we can come back to them, but I, I'd rather show you the pretty pictures on a technical day. Now uh, here's a, this is what the uh, before and after figures are going to look like. This is a conventional building, tw 10 condominium units built in New Hampshire according to standards which prevail today as against the energy conserving house. So look at, look at where it is. That's enough to convince lots of people. Uh, here's the Cary Arboretum in New York Botanical Gardens. Here we had a very interesting project. There was a very lovable board of trustees that were administering this trust and gave the land to the New York Botanical Gardens for a site up in Millbrook, New York, for botanical gardens and for a headquarters building and a, re and a laboratory. And there was five charges, I think I can remember. The one was don't pollute the air, don't pollute the aquifer, don't use any natural resources, don't change the topography, and one other don't. It says, can you do it? It says, of course. How do you do it? We well, don't build a building. Oh, but we want a building, so we'll have a building, but we have to reduce those uh, negative impacts as much as possible, and hopefully enhance the environment. That's a lot to ask for a building to make it look better, but sometimes it can be done. 
Anyway, this is the first uh, model of the first building. Malcolm Wells was the architect. Malcolm Wells done a lot of underground architecture. He's kind of noted for his gentle architecture, very in tune with passive systems. He's a passive man himself, not passive in a negative sense at all, but very gentle and very uh, amenable to working uh, together in groups. Uh, we had this model built, and first we did an energy, conscious, energy conservation study. And we're seeing more and more of this develop, that energy conservation services are above and beyond the normal architectural engineering services. And clients are paying extra for this service, and they should. And the system should be studied very thoroughly, and then go into design after the conscious energy systems are studied. And we did have a contract, not only to, oh, the other was to save uh, potable water. That was the fifth charge. So we looked at recycling sewage, collecting rainwater tanks, and uh, all these things are in this building, thermal mass, this building will use 35,000 BTUs per square foot per year, and most of it will all be solar. 85% will be by solar. We run out of solar heat, we have a deep well, we put the well water in a tank, and we use a heat pump to cool the well water from 50 degree, 55 degrees to 45 degrees, actually cooling well water and rejecting heat into the building at 110 degrees. When we looked at this model, we were disappointed. Um, and, and the next picture, which is even uh, a little bit more dramatic uh, of the model, uh, looked like a futuristic Woody Allen picture, and they weren't going to make any Woody Allen pictures in Millbrook, New York. So he said, that you could build on any building. You could put a billboard on top of any building. That's not a solar building. Everything else is a conscious energy conservation building. We had one floor beneath, uh, completely below grade, and we brought light in through light wells like they did in Crete 3,000 years ago. And uh, there were many, many great features in the building, but the building was disappointing because it looked like a billboard. So we went back to drawing boards and came up with another concept that uh, looked like this. This is the model now of the building. And here with an experimental greenhouse in the front, one story underground with a sawtooth roof. Now the sawtooth roof did a lot of things. First of all, we sloped it at 57 degrees so that it accommodated the collectors at the proper tilt for that latitude. We also wanted to go to landscape planning here. Landscape planning means no partitions. Landscape planning is more efficient. You partition. Uh, reflect light, they also absorb light. So when you get rid of partitions, you can light a space with less energy than if you had the same gross area divided into small spaces. But as you get larger spaces, the room dimensions change and the, uh, a low ceiling with a large space is very uh, unpleasant and, and certainly not a satisfactory. So by raising the roof literally and going to a truss, we're able to get high spaces, wood trusses, or very, very handsome spaces. Uh, this is a cross section. And now we've got spaces in here that are, are really grand with an exposed wood truss, blue lambs, I guess they say in architectural terminology, don't they? Huh? The collector's facing south. Uh, we had sod here, but we removed that. We found we could do the same thing with insulation with less trouble with roots and less trouble with the water running off. And we do get some reflection from this surface back onto the collector. Reflectors can improve the performance of collectors by about 20 to 22 percent. So that building will use 15% of the energy the building would normally use. Uh, again, this costs about 5% more than conventional construction. Uh, this is a picture of it under construction, actual building, and the picture with a uh, collector on the roof. Now, uh, here we ran into some problems. They had a, a wood support for this, and the wood was not specified as to quality grade dryness. It shrunk badly, and the collectors all sagged. They came off, and they have to be put back up again. I'll share some errors with you. The $60,000 error. Um, everybody makes them. Thermal barrier. This, in the Kerry Arboretum, we'll have thermal barriers. This is a simple slide arrangement with a uh, styrofoam panel that can be slid in front of the glass and reduce the heat loss and heat gain, too. Uh, this is a picture of the final model. You see, we set it back in the woods, the north facade, where the trees act as wind breaks. We have shading on the on the, on the west, the east is bermed. Uh, one floor is completely below grade. The south is all exposed to get full benefit of the sun. And the building sits there without uh, too much damage to the environment, we think. Again, the flow diagram, two tanks, so that we can collect temp water at one temperature and not degrade it by collecting at a lower temperature and having to throw that water away. Uh, I don't think we've got time to go into the technical details of this. I'd love to, but let's go on. Okay, this is a study we did for Long Island, and I show you this.
implemented on an intensive scale. And there's the curve for annual energy usage. Now, this shows, that's another, this shows the peak, what happens to the peak summer demand. This is generating capacity. This was projected to be built to nuclear plants. This is a nuclear plant under construction. This is Long Island Lighting Company's beautiful curve that follows the, I, I think they drew the curve to follow the construction program rather the other way around. Yeah. This was our curve. You see, we wouldn't need this plant for quite a while, if ever. Wouldn't need this one for a while. This one could be delayed. This is a curve that would occur if energy conservation were implemented on a, on a major scale throughout Long Island. Ten-year program to retrofit all buildings. That's why the curve drops. And then as the, all buildings are retrofitted and new buildings come on the line, energy conserving buildings, the load begins to pick up. But here we are without the need for this plant, this plant, or this plant. And we've done this in Pennsylvania. We've done it on rather New Jersey and Connecticut and California. And every one of the shapes of these curves are the same. And what's actually happened now is Long Island Lighting Company said, well, we really didn't need this capacity, but we're going to need it in the future. So in the meantime, we'll sell half the capacity at Upper New York State is what they've done. So it, it has shown that they didn't need this, and the forecasts were done not dishonestly, but with obsolete methods that uh, bear looking. And before you spend $2 billion for these plants, you ought to take a look at what can be done with alternatives. And this is in a region of 2,700,000 people, can be repeated anywhere. The same $2 billion that it would take to build these plants, we figured how, how much this conservation program would cost. Here again was the winter low. Here's the winter peaks, flat. Same $2 billion spent to do this would produce 64,000 jobs. This would produce 16,000 jobs. The new plants would produce a BTU. For every BTU that it would produce, this one would save two and a half BTUs. You know, from an economics, from an energy standpoint, it makes, makes sense. From an institutional standpoint, we didn't say this would happen. We said this could happen. Technically, it's possible. It takes a lot of legislation, incentives, disincentives, codes, standards, uh, and then this sort of a curve could happen. What if we're wrong? What if we're up here? What if we're up here? It's still pretty good. So I think this is what we've got to strive for as we go about design individual building. Uh, just a very few quick uh, slides on some systems. There are ways to extract energy from exhaust air, the run around coil system, one air stream here, one here, with a glycol solution pumping energy. So you take heat from the exhaust air, put it in the fresh air. And there are lots of ways to do this. You can have an air to air heat exchanger. You can have a heat pipe, which is a passive heat element. You condense a, a vapor in here and take energy from one stream and put it in the other without any moving parts. And just to show you, there is a wide variety. You can take a heat pump and use it as a heat exchanger. And the heat pump can take energy both latent and sensible from one airstream, put it into another. In industry, you can take heat from baking ovens, paint spray booths, and put it into, a, into the air into the building. Let's, let's skip these and get on to some uh, double bundle condenser. The, the heat pump is really the workhorse of energy conservation today. It can do a lot of things. It moves energy from one place to another and does it quite efficiently. It uses about one third to a quarter less energy than electric resistance heating. And, um, Many states now have banned electric resistance heating for buildings. Now here's a flat plate collector, a conventional flat plate collector with uh, layers of glass or plastic, uh, absorber plate, insulation. And this is what's generally used for uh, most uh, low temperature applications like heating and hot water. This is the roof of the, George, uh, the Towns Elementary School in Atlanta, Georgia. This uh, building was retrofitted for heating and cooling. And the, you can see the amount of construction was necessary in existing building to accommodate the collectors. <coughs> Next slide shows the collectors going in place. And then the collectors and reflectors. And we found by putting these reflectors opposite the collectors, we could bounce sunlight on the collectors and save about 20% of the energy that would be required if we didn't have the reflectors. It's cheaper to build reflectors than it is to buy collectors. Uh, this configuration, these angles, are, we've worked out a computer program now to be able to do them for any latitude, whether you're heating or cooling. Uh, this cost a lot of money, this project. It was not cost effective. Absorption refrigeration with air conditioning and solar is not cost effective today. It's one of the things we found out. One of the reasons is these are, these are the storage tanks. Here, look at the amount of piping, this tank farm. We couldn't get the tanks in the building. Uh, this installation alone just cost a lot of money. And uh, so I think it's important to pick out the kinds of projects that are most uh, suitable for solar and for conservation. This was a demonstration project. The government wanted to build it in a hurry. 
demonstrate uh, some principles. We are collecting a lot of good data. However, it, it's not cost effective and just this complexity of piping that's, that's really conventional plumbing is very, very costly to say nothing of the collectors. The collectors are the cheapest part of this whole project. Uh, here's a finished school with the collectors on the roof. It works beautifully. It, uh, it uh, practically carries the load, the summer cooling load. But again, we looked at the program in the school and they had kids spread all over this building in the summertime. We said, can you consolidate the educational programs in part of the building and cut off the rest of it? And they found they could do it. And by doing that, we cut the air conditioning load from about 100 tons of refrigeration down to 30 tons. And so we made the program changes uh, to accommodate what could be built. And again, it was, a, it was a, an effort to look at both the loads and the demand. Uh, just to test collectors, we used to uh, have many of these uh, sun simulators around. This happened to be in Honeywell's factory. Now there are testing stations that have sprung up. They're approved by National Bureau of Standards, and collectors are tested under a standard procedure. Here's a tubular collector. It's the Owens, Illinois. Uh, this collector is evacuated, has a vacuum between the outer tubes and the inner tubes, they're concentric tubes, and you can generate high temperatures with this collector. You can generate temperatures above 200 degrees easily for, for absorption and cooling. The problem with this collector is you can't drain the top headers, and you can't vent the bottom. So they've had some problems with these collectors, uh, problems that are uh, just in, the, in, the, in, in conceiving the design. Uh, so they're efficient. But again, they're troublesome and there have to be some modifications made, probably with headers on the top and the bottom rather than the way this is arranged. It's just a header in the middle. Uh, here's a storage system in a house as compared to what you saw in the tank farm. It's neat and packaged and uh, of course uh, the costs are vastly different. This is a uh, storage system too. This is George Lerf's house here in Colorado. He has an air collector system. These sono air ducts are, are uh, receptacles for, for rocks, and uh, we have a rock storage, he has a rock storage system in here, and he had no place to put the storage, so if you can't hide it, flaunt it, and this is in his front hall. Uh, just, a, just a few solar houses to give you an idea of what's happening. Here's a, uh, Owens, Illinois, in an installation. Uh, again, uh, the same collectors in an installation in Illinois. Uh, another one uh, in Aurora, Colorado. Uh, some solar collectors. Some of these from the HUD demonstration program. Uh, Peachtree, uh, Georgia. Uh, this is the trickle collector, the Thomaston collector. It's a, everybody says an inefficient collector. What's efficiency? Uh, you don't get many BTUs per square foot of collector service, therefore it's inefficient. I, don't, I disagree. You get a lot of surface for a, few, a small amount of dollars, so you get a lot of BTUs per dollar invested, and that's the way efficiency should be looked at. Uh, the water's taken up the top, it's trickled down through an open uh, corrugated web below the layer of glass, picked up in a storage tank that's surrounded by rocks for thermal storage and the air blows through the rocks into the house. It's a very effective system. Uh, this is a retrofit of a townhouse in Philadelphia, existing building. Uh, this is a little ski lodge we did up in New England with uh, solar collectors uh, <coughs> here and a very large reflecting surface in front of the collectors. Uh, again, a lot of passive design here, a great deal of solar heat, free heat, and again, on this scale, this made a very delightful little uh, uh, ski lodge. I can't see that very well, I'll skip it. This is another uh, solar uh, Thomaston system in, in um, Colorado, where uh, they used something like, um, through November, $1.50 worth of gas in this house. We talked to the family that lived here. Uh, a lot of people don't like the looks of solar collectors. Um, they aren't particularly beautiful. On the other hand, uh, if they're done properly and integrated in the building, and some of them are, they, they look quite attractive. This was an early house up in Massachusetts, one of the early, one of the first of the 20 houses that existed for 20 years with solar. Uh, the Bridges building, Frank Bridges down in New, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, the first commercial building. This is a retrofit. This is Dick Crowther, who's a really uh, energy conscious architect in Denver. And uh, here he's retrofitting this existing building by modifying the roof for co proper collector slope. And he's finished this job. People live in it. And uh, it's sold. And uh, that's the major question. Can you sell solar? Sure. Uh, he sold it on the basis that uh, this was going to save enough energy in the, in the life of this system in the next 15 year period to pay for itself. And that's on present day energy costs. I think the payback would be a lot faster. 
This uh, is not an upside down house. This is a Thomaston house I showed you earlier with the collectors here. And uh, from any angle, it looks about the same. This is the Dover One house. The first, the first system that has both uh, uh, solar collectors for heating and photovoltaic cells for generation of electricity from sunlight. Uh, cost $135,000, it was the initial one. So the cost of solar cells has come down even since these were put in. Of course, the space program, they were $2,000 a watt. A year ago, they were $15 a watt. They're down $11 a watt. And we expect to see them down about 50 cents a watt. 50 cents a watt, photovoltaics are going to be competitive with any central generating plant. And it's decentralized. You don't have the distribution losses. There's enough sunlight falls on this house to provide all the energy it needs all year. Uh, this is a collector installation I show you uh, that happened, uh, that was occurring in New Haven. Now these collectors uh, are Sunworks collectors and they're fitting between the roof rafters uh, of the building. With the idea being that uh, there'd be money saved by combining the roof and the solar collectors. Didn't turn out to be that way. First of all, the collectors are narrower than, than normal because uh, they have to fit in the roof between the roof rafters. Number two, the piping became difficult because the rafters interfered with the horizontal runs of piping. And perhaps most, in, uh, two, uh, two other important factors. One, the collectors are pretty true material. Metal casings are true, but wood is not. And wood warps and twists and turns, and it's very hard to get a good seal here between the collector and the wood construction. And probably the payoff was that the contractor said, hey, you're holding me up on my construction. It's cost me twice as much to put my cheap roof on, which I could slap on it and get out of here before you guys ever showed up. So therefore, his cost was about twice as much to put the roof on, and all the anticipated savings disappeared. So these are the kind of things I think we have to take a look at when we look at building construction methods. And sometimes there seems to be savings, but you've got to look at the construction process as well. The process is important, and the construction industry has had a way of working, and they aren't going to be easily disturbed by the solar industry, I can tell you. They're going to continue their merry way for a long time, and it's something that's got to be taken into account when we figure the systems and their costs. Uh, this is a concept of a uh, wind generator and a wind furnace. Uh, wind is a, is a very, very good source of energy, particularly in Long Island, we found. However, it's hard to store electrical energy. However, if the wind is used to generate electricity to heat hot water and the hot water is stored and used for heating, it becomes a pretty efficient system. And wind with solar becomes a pretty, uh, pretty good system. Uh, again, the concept of wind generators in Long Island with multiple number of generators. Uh, this system could provide all the energy for Long Island, New York State, part of Pennsylvania, and part of Connecticut with, with wind, if nothing else. Um, the technology is not that far developed. It's not far away. So there are alternatives that appear on the horizon. Let me not go through the rest of these slides. Um, I have the lights, please. I'm going to take about 10 more minutes. I just want to show you. Uh, can, I, can I set this up down while I'm going through a few things here? Just a couple of points. One I've tried to show you, there are many, many alternatives that have proved to be doable, practical, buildable, and energy conserving. And so we, pardon? Okay. So that I think this gives us some precedent and some, some really hope to, to carry these things further. Now I've got a, just a, a couple of uh, pointers. I'd like to point out four a couple of items I'd like to point out, if I can find page eight. For architects and engineers that I think really are required to make some of these things happen, then I want to quickly go through about five view graphs of an energy conscious building that evolved from the function and from the outside environment. Uh, number one, just, just 12 points here very quickly. The architect and the engineer must. He's got to review the forgotten, things we put aside. Mass, sun, the Crete example, the adobe example. Uh, things that we have uh, forgotten about, now we're, we're, we're bringing back out and using. Uh, there's, a, there's a particular need for self-education and training. In our own office, we have seminars every week to retread good engineers, good architects who have not been especially energy conscious or especially uh, trained in energy conservation, and we find that these weekly seminars bring the entire office up to speed. Uh, there's got to be lots of workshops in the region. We're finding these. The computer. The computer is a blessing and a, and a curse. The computer, when it's used properly, there's no, there's no other way to do the task. However, we find that the computer is used in the early stages of the projects to the detriment of thinking and analytical thinking. Uh, almost everything that comes to mind gets programmed in the computer. 
You get a load of paper out, you're married to that status quo of that paper, you plot the results. After you get through, you can't afford to go back and look at the problem. So the computer, I think, has to be used judiciously. You have to see how it's, how it's, how it's programmed and used to do repetitive calculations and alternatives, but not to take the place of the basic philosophical and conceptual thinking. I think the architects have to lead and not follow the client. I think he's got, the architect is in a position to make his points known, and it requires this kind of leadership. I find that legislators listen to architects, they listen to engineers, they listen to what's coming from the field. I think we've got to participate in public affairs, in, in the legislative, in the codes, in the school boards. Uh, we're part of the, we're part of the industry. We've got to be able to lend our expertise to the, those who, who need this kind of, of, of help. Uh, early education. We're seeing a lot more of it, but uh, we're still a long way to go. It's got to start in the very early grades. We've got no economics. Architect and engineering is economics. There's one thing. Er economics underlies everything. Everything. Even, it underlies even human values. Human values are not an absolute for the moment. There's a human value to be able to get to a grocery store with, by walking or by train or by bus. It's a human value, but it's economics. And so we find that the economic analyses are neglected and systems are designed and presented without the cost benefits and the paybacks. Economics, however, I think have to go broader than what we've been used to. And we've got to look at what it's really worth to the country to have a, another gallon of oil on the ground or another cubic foot of gas that we can use for fertilizer and not burn it up. So I think we've got a lot, to, a lot, a lot of ways to go looking at the macroeconomics and revising our system there. We found but we've had to develop a very, very extensive energy library. And uh, it's, it's hard to know what is worthwhile reading and keeping and what isn't. There's just such a tremendous load of material. However, this becomes a, tool, a stock, a tool in our trade, and we've got to begin to assemble these kinds of, of, of guides that, that help us all. We've got to really know the building materials. We've got to know the, the physics of buildings and the physics of, of, of heat transfer, the chemistry, chemical properties. So it becomes a much broader educational process for the architect and engineer than it was formerly. And again, passive first, conservation, and then solar. Now let me just, if I might indulge for just five minutes, looking at these view graphs. In my work in the master's program at Pratt, we're designing an energy conscious building, a museum that will act as an educational institution. We started for kids three years old, three to 80. And it's a active museum, it's a, it's a hands-on workshop, it's a classroom, and the building itself becomes an energy machine. The building represents the process. And this is how the, the form evolved from, from that concept. Okay, this is looking at, at the front, the south facade. The south facade is large because we want to capture as much sun as possible. We've got a greenhouse down at this level that uh, collects heat, stores heat, solar collectors at these levels, and um, large uh, storage columns here that both store energy seasonally, store heat in the summer to use in the winter, and store cool in the winter to use in the summer. There are also structural columns. Can you just put the, slide them in for me, please? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Now you can see the building taking shape here. The, uh, the building tapers to the north. The north is the most energy consump consumptive facade, so that we want very small exposure to the north. So it slopes back, it's bermed up. There's an atrium in the middle here that brings light and heat into the interior. There's skylighting across here. And again, the greenhouse here. This is the Hudson River, which is used as a source for cooling and for heat pump. And the, all the energy for this building is, is by wind, by sun and by garbage, generating electricity, and there's no need for connection to the utility company. Next one there. These were, uh, Xerox is made from slides. The quality is not good, but it does demonstrate something, how the shape has evolved. These, these are the columns I spoke about, looking for the back of planetarium so they can plot the course of the sun at uh, different times of the year, study the, study the solar system, the back, the mechanical systems, I think, are shown better in a, in a future when they're back here with uh, glass so that as you come into this building, all parts are visible at once. And uh, let, let's see the next one, please. Huh? 
Uh, here's a view from the east with the entrance here, the storage and uh, structural system uh, here. And these columns serve another purpose. They also act as a sunshade and a windbreak for windows that are mounted between the columns. Sorry, the quality of these isn't better. Here's a view looking down on the entrance. As you come into the entrance, there's a waterfall and a uh, water wheel to demonstrate hydropower. Uh, the officers look down out of this space. The, burn, the land is burned to the north and all around. Mechanical systems in the back. And the next one, please. And we found by, by, by approaching this design problem in from the interior and the exterior, they meshed. We found what spaces wanted to see the sun, which needed the sun, which didn't, what space could be buried back, and the floor plan will show that. This is looking head on. I think we've, we've seen this. And let's just see what the floor plan might look. Is that the floor plan? No, let's see. OK, fine. There's the mechanical spaces in the back with glass so that as you come into this building, you can see the entire mechanical system. Everything is visible to visitors, and there are workshops in here which can be closed, but with glass partitions so that experiments can go on without being interfered, but in view of the public. Next one, please. And this is a cutaway view of the model showing uh, what happens on different floors. It's not clear enough, and I won't spend any time with it. Uh, this is the uh, lower level of floor plan with the auditorium under the entrance. This atrium uh, bringing light throughout the entire building into the interior. At the bottom of the atrium, an experimental house with an experimental landscaping site with passageways. Exhibit spaces on this floor. Greenhouse here with workshops and biomass and other kinds of laboratories within the greenhouse. And the columns here, which, as I said, are multi-use. They also house the fire stairs and mechanical spaces back here. We'll just look at one more. And again, as you go up an upper level with a little auditorium, uh, exhibit space, and across this entire full height space, there's a skylight on top. And the skylight and the atrium are controlled so that they're turned off at nighttime. And they also have louvers to direct the sun in any direction with, into the interior of the building. These workshops are built within the truss spaces, Verndale trusses eight feet deep between floors, and these workshops and classrooms can be changed to suit conditions and sizes as needed without making any major change within the building. Uh, let's, let's not, uh, it's 9.30 and I want to leave a few times, a little, little time for questions. Uh, I just want to, uh, just to sum this up, uh, just, just one word, uh, save. Thank you. Yes? Questions? Here comes. Um, all this research you're doing is to get the building to work better, be lighted, and kind of safer. On a small building project, like a, a house that's a little bigger, how much time can you go through in the design process for a piece of the architectural bill, the engineering bill, more than you can afford to save? Well, we found now that we can design these systems without any increase in engineering costs or architectural costs because after you've built up a, a body of knowledge, do the research, and we've been very fortunate because the research was paid for by the great white father, uh, we find that it does not cost more to do energy conscious design. You just do it automatically. You know where your windows are going. You know what the sizes are. It really does not cost more. Now, in a large building, it costs more for computer programs and, and analytical programs. And, and we find that clients are paying more for that. So it's an additional service and uh, is probably the best investment that can be made at that stage if the money is spent at that stage. For instance, on the General Service Administration building in California, we have two contracts, one for energy conservation. It's an $18 million building. The energy services cost $57,000. Um, the design is a normal design fee on top of that. Now, the $57,000 will produce energy savings of, of really um, in, in the neighborhood of 100 and some odd thousand dollars a year. So from the state standpoint, it's certainly you, you can't get a much better investment than that. But the, but the interesting thing is the state is paying for additional energy services. In our residences, it, it's not that complicated. It's smaller. It can be done. 
I think that some of it, we've got to bear these costs. We've got to spend a few more hours ourselves, and I think this is where we make our own contribution to our own education, and I don't think we can get paid for every dollar we spend initially. I think it would come back, but it does, t it does take a lot of extra effort, a lot of midnight oil on Saturdays and Sundays for a while, and, but then after a while, it begins to be part of your normal practice. Uh, all right, let me clarify that. First of all, uh, if we take the uses of the solar and, and heating domestic hot water is probably the best use because it's a year-round load and once you bought the collector, you save every month. And after that, probably tempering outdoor air because it's a low temperature application and laboratories and hospitals and other areas that need outdoor air, solar is a very good application. Then space heating and then uh, cooling is not cost effective at all. Now, it depends what the conventional fuel costs are. In, uh, in the Con Ed territory in Westchester, with electricity, 8 to 10 cents a kW, all those systems are cost effective. In the TV Valley area, nothing will compete with it. Where gas, present prices of gas, it's hard to, uh, to make a solar heating system cost competitive even on a 20 year basis. However, with deregulation, which has sort of come, we're going to see a, a complete change in this uh, relationship. Against oil, we can find, we can design, well, let me, let me, what, one step backwards for a minute. A passive solar system is cost effective today. An active system, less. But passive is, is, is cost effective right now, almost anywhere in the country. Even up in the northwest in Seattle, where a passive trom wall can save 30% of the energy. So that those systems are cost effective immediately. The hot water systems everywhere in the country against electricity is cost effective on about a five to six year payback. Uh, against oil, about a eight, 10 to 12 year payback, and against gas, uh, about 20. For space heating, we find about a 20 year payback against oil, uh, still against gas, it's not that good in almost any area. So that uh, we're seeing this relationship change, and again, cost effective, what does that mean? That's on present fuel cost, and we look at escalation, and we don't know what it's going to be. We always plot this uh, uh, with a sensitivity to a 5%, a 10%, a 15% year increase, and see where it falls in that curve. With fuel cost escalation, uh, it, it changed the payback period tremendously. And many people are buying systems based on expected future costs. And uh, I don't think they'd be disappointed. However, uh, we don't know. Well, GE makes one uh, exactly the same, almost exactly the same. Yes, they've just come out with theirs. And they have not yet either corrected the draining or venting problem. So that uh, we, I think we'll find the same problems there. They can be, they can be licked, but they haven't been. Uh, Owens Corning also makes one. Uh, they were smart enough to withdraw theirs from the market before they sold them commercially, and they went back to the drawing board. Uh, the best of them is made by Phillips in Holland, which can drain and can vent. And they're very, very uh, efficient. The, the vacuum, of course, cuts all the, all the losses. They have a selective surface on the glass. And they can get temperatures of 300, 350 degrees, enough to drive a, a Rankin cycle engine turbine. So, I th and also, of course, the technology, the glass making technology is so well known that it looks very promising for reducing production costs. Between air and water systems? Well, the differences, I think, can be easily identified. The water systems, uh, in most areas, you've got a problem with potential freezing, which means a heat exchanger or a drain down system. Drain down systems have problems of reventing, and, uh, and um, the, the safest system is a heat exchanger and a glycol, but you lose uh, efficiency because the heat exchanger has an, about a 10 degree approach temperature, which means you've got to generate higher temperatures, and the heat exchanger costs more. Uh, their leakage in, in, in wet systems and corrosion. With the air system, you don't have any of those problems. If you have leakage, it's air leakage, which doesn't do any damage, and you find it and plug it. Uh, for housing, for houses, I like an air system better than a wet system. And at lower temperatures, if you're, if you're designing systems, the fluid temperature is 110, 120 degrees, the air collector is about as efficient as a water collector. Now, the air systems are not any good for cooling at all. They're not any good for higher temperature process. And in larger buildings, the size of the ducts becomes a constraint to get the air in and out of the collector back down to storage. The rock storage can become troublesome on larger systems. So that we find for houses, uh, I think the air systems are preferable. 
And for larger buildings, I think uh, it would lean more toward the wet system for those reasons. I would say it's the same as what you found there. Uh, those that I've smelled have been a little musty at times. Um, it's a difficult thing to control. Uh, I, I don't think you can really control it. You can either mask it or you can draw it out and it, it recurs periodically. In one house I saw in Washington, I could see a little moldy up on the wall. So these are problems and uh, with, the rock, with the rock bed system. And I, I haven't seen that they've been solved. I guess if you save enough money, you put up with it. Well, you can use, uh, of course, there are ways to do it. You can use a charcoal filter, of course, in the, in the circuit and take out all the odors. It's another additional resistance. There's already a resistance. The air systems do use more power for circulation. The fans take more power than the pump in the wet system because the resistance through the rock bed and filters and that sort of thing. Uh, again, it's not, it's not a, in the overall system, it's not serious, but it is, it is an item that you've got to look out for. Uh, that's not very, uh, very inexpensive either, and also it's only effective in, in really humid climates. Uh, I think it's a really good system, especially in combination with, with commercial refrigeration, so that you dehumidify the air with a, with a desiccant, and you regenerate it with solar heat, and you take all the humidity out of the air, of course, and then you just use the refrigeration for sensible cooling at a higher suction temperature, which is more efficient. Now, I think this system has a, has a good promise in the Gulf states and, uh, and other areas where you experience high humidities. I don't think it would be particularly effective in Iowa, even though you get some days with high humidity, because the percentage of time the humidity is that high, I don't think it would be a cost-effective system. I'm not saying it doesn't get humid, but the duration of the humidity and uh, it's not, first of all, it's not a very cost, uh, cheap system to start with, so you've got to really have a good humidity load like like Washington D.C. or like like the Gulf states, and maybe maybe it's that bad here. Maybe I don't know that. It, uh, not in packages, but certainly all the components can be bought. Yeah. Yeah.